Good afternoon. Welcome to our discussion, Investing Ourselves, Economic Opportunity in Older Black Women. I'm Angela Badeau, publisher and editor-in-chief of Her Life Magazine, and also honored to serve on the board of the Center for Workforce Inclusion. Before we get started with our esteemed guests, I want to remind everyone to mark their calendars for October 26th, when Gary Officer, President and CEO of the Center, hosts a conversation with Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh to discuss the Biden administration's efforts to rebuild our economy on the foundation of an equitable, resilient workforce. Information will be sent in a follow-up email from this event. I want to also remind our audience that if you have any questions during our discussion today, please select the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. I will do my best, time permitting, and as appropriate to raise your questions with our guests. The Center for Workforce Inclusion is the only national nonprofit organization dedicated exclusively to the older worker, older being 50 years or more. The center empowers low-income job seekers who have been overlooked by traditional workforce programs with in-demand skills, resources to overcome barriers to employment, and pathways to economic security. Older workers are a pillar of our labor force. By 2025, they will comprise 25% of the American workforce. These also happen to be the same individuals who have been most impacted by the COVID recession. When it comes to the impact of COVID recession, the impact the COVID recession is having on women, it has been called a she session. Mm -hmm. Women have been displaced out of the workforce. And when it comes to older BIPOC women, they face challenges on multiple fronts, especially older black women who, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, have experienced the steepest drop in labor force participation during the pandemic recession. According to Janelle Jones, Chief Economist for the Department of Labor, in an interview she did for U.S. News and World Report, Black women have experienced the deepest cut in labor force participation, have been the slowest in job recovery. For example, one in four Black women work in the public sector, and state and local governments employed one million fewer workers in February 21, 2021, compared to February 2020. When older Black women do acquire employment, it is most often a low-wage job likely to be phased out due to automation or a job in an industry which continues to be deeply affected by the pandemic, which does not afford consistent economic opportunity. Meanwhile, 60% of Black women are the primary breadwinners in their household. Older Black women are a critical segment of our workforce. They play an indispensable role in empowering our national economy and building vibrant communities. Their earnings are vital to closing the generational wealth gap. Despite these facts, funding and policy initiatives continue to focus primarily on workforce programs for students and younger workers. Here at the Center for Workforce Inclusion, we are creating and supporting additional ways to identify and resolve issues for this demographic. In our 60-year history, we've worked with nearly half a million low-income job seekers, primarily Black women, who, to provide training, support, and employment opportunities. We launched our sister organization, CWI Labs, to lead national discussions and advance innovative solutions on workforce equity. To that end, we've asked two important guests here today to discuss the challenges and, more importantly, solutions that will lead to equitable opportunity for older Black women. Asahi Pompey is Global Head of Corporate Engagement and President of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Goldman Sachs launched last year its One Million Black Women Initiative, a commitment of $10 billion in direct capital investment and $100 million in philanthropic support to address gender and racial biases that Black women have faced for dec decades. Asahi has seen firsthand the transformative power of philanthropy on communities families, and individuals. She spent her formative years in Guyana and immigrated to Brooklyn as a child. She has studied and lived in other countries, including Japan and Germany, and graduated from Columbia Law School. She joined Goldman Sachs in 2006, was named Managing Director in 2010, and Partner in 2018. In addition to her role, she's a member of the Management Committee, the Global Diversity Committee, and the Sustainable Finance Steering Group at Goldman. Welcome, Asahi. Tanya Vesey, here. is the president and CEO at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Tanya spearheads the foundation's mission to advance global black community by developing leaders, informing policy, and educating the public on CBF initiatives, 
and most importantly, solutions that will lead to economic opportunity for older Black women. For more than 20 years, she's provided counsel to top corporations, nonprofits, public entities, and elected officials in issues management, crisis communications, corporate social responsibility, and diversity and inclusion strategy. Welcome, Tanya. We have two powerhouse women today, and ladies, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Gonna, thank you. I'm going to get started with a question I'm going to direct to Asahi. Um, Asahi, what, you, you just reading about everything that Goldman's doing and what you're doing with your work there, we're so impressed with the Million Black Women Initiative. It's just, um, it's just fantastic. And I know that it was launched back in March. And what captured me most is that you've identified, and I think as you put it in what I read, to invest in the arc of a Black woman's life which includes proper health care, education, housing, job creation, financial literacy, and access to capital. Can you explain more about your One Million Black Women initiative and how you see older Black women job seekers fitting into this mix? I want to say thank you, Angela, for having us. Um, and uh, Tanya and I are excited to have this discussion with you um, and the audience. A Million Black Women, I think, is one of the you know my proudest moments in my 16 years at Goldman Sachs, and frankly, the 25 years that I've been in the workforce. Uh, if you told me as a girl that you know one of the story banks on Wall Street after 150 years was going to do the largest commitment ever in this country, specifically focused on Black women, I'm not sure I would have believed it. Um, but we found ourselves in, you know, post the murder of George Floyd, having internal discussions around how we could use capital markets as a force to narrow that 90% wealth gap. And I'm going to say it again, because it is staggering. The 90% wealth gap between a black woman in this country and a white male. And when we look through the data, and we boil that back, and we have an amazing report called Black Womenomics, Mm -hmm. um, my partner from years ago, Kathy Matsui, had published a report, Womenomics, about the impact of women in the Japanese workforce. And we decided to do a report, Black Womenomics, that really, I think, is explosive in terms of talking about what's really happening in this country as it relates to Black women. You know, Malcolm X said 50 years ago, the, who's the most neglected person in America? It's the Black woman. Well, in 2021, 50 years later, it still is. And so as we thought about where could we make an impact, Angela, we thought, well, healthcare, we're in the midst of the pandemic. We've seen how it's ravished our communities. My cousin passed away. My younger brother's best friend passed away. We all have stories of that nature. And we thought, well, maybe it should be healthcare. And then we looked across the board and we said, well, maybe it's education. And then we said, well, a third of Black women live in unsafe housing. Well, maybe it should be housing. Um, we know that entrepreneurship is one of the key ways to narrow the wealth gap. Well, maybe it should be small business and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And we said, look, mic drop, what ails us is not one thing. It's multiple things. And so we've got to attack it on multiple levels. And hence that traveling from that came the thesis to travel along the arc of a black woman's life mm -hmm. and start with her mother. Did she have adequate uh, maternal care um, when the child was in the womb to be able to have come into the world to be able to develop? Healthcare doing more there. Um, when she's in preschool, was she able to go to a preschool where she could start to learn to read by the age of six or seven, uh, like other children? As she grows in her career and she thinks about higher education, is there any shot at her being able to attend college, community college, four-year college? And how do we create that pathway for her? And as we think about her later on in life, can she retire? And can she retire having a nest egg that she's left for her family to potentially create a generational wealth? And so that's where we said, we're gonna travel along the arc of her life and make investments along the way. Um, and that's where the thesis emerged, Angela. Well, that's fantastic. And I think I also saw in one of your um, data points is that you estimated that, and don't, you can correct my number, I think it was, if we really address this issue, it's 454 billion that it adds to the gross domestic product if we bring black women along. And that's significant for everybody, correct? Everybody, and you've got that number exactly right, 450 billion in annual US GDP when you narrow the wage gap for black women. And I'll add another number out there. That narrowing the wage, the earning gap for black women would create 1.7 trillion jobs 
not just for black people, that's just jobs in general, right? And so when you invest in a black woman, you're investing in our economy, you're investing in our communities, you're investing in us as a people, human beings broadly around the world. That's phenomenal. And I just want to do a little a data point for our listeners there is that you mentioned something about as Black women get older. And one of the things that we recognize is that, you know, the economic security of older Black women towards the t- retirement age is, is very poor, actually, and no pun intended on that word. And in fact, we just published a piece by um, Christian Gonzalez Rivera, who's the Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives and a partner at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. And we saw there that we also see a lot of caregivers with women and a lot of women as they become um, doing their caregiving duties have contributed to a reversal of gains for women in the workforce. And not only from 1970, but what we're seeing right now to 2019, that that's taking them out of the workforce. And the average black person who dies with dementia depletes all their savings and has no assets to pass to the relatives. So this is an issue that if we're not building that wealth earlier in the game, or we're not even addressing what people who are in the fifties, who I consider young now, because I'm getting older, <laughs> you know, um, that we need to really start building that wealth for them for as they age. And then they can also continue to take care of themselves. So I think the points that you're hitting with uh, that program and you, you guys just decided, I think, you know, we look at bringing stakeholders at the table. You guys brought stakeholders at the table for that and really came up with these different data sets, data points of where we needed to really attack the problem. And it's not just one problem. So thank you for that. We appreciate the explanation. Moving on to Tanya, um, just to talk about the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, you just had your 50th annual legislative conference um, with, you know, you, you focus on economic development and wealth creation. And can you talk a little bit more about that? And we've had some conversations on Black women and your thought process there. And I think within that agenda, we can really incorporate that older black women and the effect um, that we have right now as a result of the pandemic and where we need to go to retrain them with upskilling or reskilling. Can you just give us some of your thoughts, Tanya? Yes, so thank you, Angela, for for having us as well. And before I start, kudos uh, to Goldman Sachs because I sit around the table in many cases and talk to our corporate sponsors about how they can help remove barriers for Black folks. And in many cases, it is not as inclusive or or detailed as what you all are doing. Um, And so I just want to say, before I talk about the Congressional Black Caucus, just just congratulations on your approach. Absolutely, That's a very unique approach, um, but necessary. Um, Yes, so the Congressional Black Caucus, you know, first of all, I would say that the Congressional Black Caucus is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Uh, We are separate from the Congressional Black Caucus members. Although 45 years ago, nine Congressional Black Caucus members got together to create the foundation. And our job at the foundation um, is to develop global black leaders, but also to educate the public and inform the public on policies that affect everyday black people. And we do a lot of that, Angela, as you mentioned, through our annual legislative conference. We have over, we had over 80 sessions. Many of them were hosted by members of Congress, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And some of the topics and many of the topics that are discussed during that time is about the wealth gap in the black community. And we talk also a lot about the skill gap in the black community as well. And because we think those topics are very important. And so as we talk about what the foundation is doing, uh, we about a year ago, as many other people did after the, uh, the, the killing of George Floyd, we had to take a step back as well and say, how can we be a part of the solution as it relates to removing these structural barriers that prevent Black people from thriving? And so we created our National Racial Equity 
uh, initiative. And part of that initiative is to really look at policies um, that we believe would move, remove some of the structural barriers that people see taking place as it relates to training programs, as it relates to just opportunities. And so we were able to really dive into that through research, and we can definitely talk a little bit more about that, but through research and some and partnering more with CBC members on policies that can remove some of the systemic barriers that are in place. Um, and so um, I think there's many opportunities opportunities through I, our eyes as it relates to policy and as it relates to educating the public on where they can find information and help and being able to thrive in this community, in their community. Thank you, Tanya. And Tanya, um, I saw, we saw that um, the foundation published a paper, which I, we thought was very topical and on point on how automation will adversely affect um, black labor, particularly in the uh, transportation industry, um, because of the automation of driverless vehicles. And, you know, who knew that it was going to disproportionately affect the black labor, you know, workforce. So um, when we look at that, I think there is a lot more expansion on that because there's other places where automation is going to be affecting, um, especially the black workforce. And we'll see the foundation be looking at that too, perhaps in the future. It will, and I think what the paper what the paper initially discovered is that we have a serious skill gap within the Black community. And so our hope when we develop papers and policy recommendations, um, we do that to begin to dis work closely with corporate America, with other organizations, with the CBC members to begin to create solutions to that. And so we will be digging more into programs, uh, federal programs, private programs that will begin to close that skill gap because we realize that that will, and it is, and will continue to be a, a problem with, mm -hmm. with, with um, older adults and in particular black women. Right. And, and I have to do a shameless plug here, but that is exactly what the Center for Workforce Inclusion works toward uh, that end to achieve that goal. Um, Asahi, you know, we just, uh, Tanya just brought up about George Floyd and a lot of the fact that a lot of organizations had to do a reset and a rethink about where they sit in the whole arena of racial equity. Um, and we noted that America's 50 largest corporations and their foundations when this happened, and it was all fresh and new, budged about $49.5 billion to address racial inequality. Um, and so far, only a small fraction of that, $1.7 billion, has been distributed. And I think Goldman is a great example that is really looking at commitments they make and how they realize those and doing metrics. So can you just expand a little bit more about your thoughts on there was this big corporate push, and now we see, you know, did everybody walk the walk and talk the talk? Yeah, I mean, you're spot on in this question because, and I'm sure that Tanya and the Congressional Black Caucus are having similar conversations. We all saw the reports, it was, you know, week after week, different people were making commitments. And then I, I said at the time, I have to say that the, the measure of this is not going to be, you know, July, August, September, 2020, but 2024 and 2025, where are these sustained or are we going to look around and find out it was episodic? It, you know, it caught a news headline, you know, your competitor did it. So you did it as well. Um, and look, money's money. And so those are th that funds going into black communities, I commend. But in order for us to be able to make sustained change, we need sustained investment. Mm -hmm. And as we were building out a million black women, we knew that at the outset, we wanted this to be at least a 10 year commitment. And that's what we announced in March, right? And so once a corporation goes out with that, you're not going back, not that we would even want to, but to sort of challenge each of ourselves to say, we're gonna do something and invest day one for the long term and know the new cycle changes, you know, this is going to be, you know, the thing that's getting the headlines today and it's going to be something tomorrow, but this is a struggle. 
And in order for us to maintain the work and push progress through the struggle, there have to be people who are committed to this work, even when the news headlines are looking someplace else, they're staying the course. Even when something else is pulling people astray, they're staying the course. And that comes from, at the outset, I think, building it into the framework of the programs. And that was one of the things that was one of the capstones of a million Black women. But I want to pick up on something that Tanya mentioned about the skills gap, because I think that's particularly important. One of the things that we've been seeing and other corporations as well is we almost automatically say every position needs a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of peel back the onion, you kind of say, well, this, can I train this person to be able to do that job? And in fact, they don't need a bachelor's degree. And so in the conversations that I'm having around the industry, it's this re-examining of, you know, are we, is, is that just another gate that we're having people go through? But in actuality, we can train them and we do train them to do the job and be able to sort of narrow that skills gap where we're giving the skills when you walk into the door and we're seeing not only the performance, but your potential, and we're investing in that potential, especially of our older workforce. And you're very right, because uh, one of the other things is that there are also gaps in needs in vocational training, which pay very well. You know, you can be a plumber or you can be in construction. Those are very high paying jobs. You know, we're looking yeah, I just did a renovation <laughs> and I'm telling you. <laughs> they get paid very well, right? And so we have to take the stigma off of that, that a four-year degree is better or you're somehow better than the person who has this skill set that is very important to the, vib the vibrancy of community. So that stigma needs to be displaced as well. And I know that there are um, programs out there and people are working to try to talk to children, you know, when they're in their formative years in school to say, here are your options. And I think, you know, we need to do more of that. We did have a question come in from Melvin Richardson, and he asks, is real estate redlining and its related effects being considered in these initiatives? And we've seen what's happened with real estate as a result of uh, COVID, but we also noticed it, what we talked about before, Asahi, is um, Housing is also very important as a part of this. You know, you need to have housing where you can live in dignity and safety and affordable housing. So I'll, I'll hand this question off to you and then Tanya, if you want to chime in as well. Housing is one of the capstones of our investment under a million Black women, but even pre when we launched this, this initiative under our urban investment group, is what, which is run by my colleague Margaret Anadu, we've been making affordable housing investments in Newark, um, in Mississippi, in, in, in parts of California, around the country for any number of years, for over a decade that we've had that group in place. But I think, Melvin, in your question, you're saying that there needs to be more of this um, and it needs to be more widespread and we need to think about it not just rurally in, in sort of urban areas, but in rural areas as well. We work closely with Bill Bynum, amazing, indomitable Bill, Bill Bynum and CDFIs in terms of our investment in communities and also as it relates to housing. The other thing as it relates to housing is technology and housing and the broadband and the digital divide that we're seeing. So it's fine if you're able to have some affordable housing, but what's the technology in that house that a child who needs to do do Zoom or after school activities or whatever the case may be, that they're able to access the full suite that they need in order to develop in that household. Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah, and I would just add to that in regard to programs and policy. I think what you will see, and particularly with uh, our, our new housing secretary, Marsha Fudge, who's a previous CBC member, that there is now a true focus on helping um, Black folks become homeowners. We've seen, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but you've seen a dramatic decline in home ownership in our own um, community. Um, and so there's a focus on grants, there's a focus on uh, financial literacy, financial education, um, and the importance of many people, in particular in the Black community, your home is your biggest asset, right? And that's how you begin to build wealth. And, um, and then you pass that wealth on to generation to generation. Um, and so I, I think you're seeing now with this new administration that focus. 
um, for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, as we talk about uh, wealth, we are in partnership with, you know, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who chairs the Finance Committee, and she's holding banks and she's holding loan companies accountable for what we would say uh, modern day 2021 redlining that is being, you know, uh, done, and it still exists. It exists as it relates to how those of us who own a home, how our home is being appraised versus someone else's home is being appraised. So there are many, I would say, barriers that are preventing uh, Black folks from creating wealth through their home ownership. And we are addressing those through a policy lens and an education lens. Fantastic, thank you. And and just that other data point is that 60% of um, Black women are head of their households. And so we're trying to, you know, help them along and, and to push them up. And w the, the one point that I just want to talk about, because we always, um, when we look at workforce development, and I even mentioned it too, is how we're trying to go to the kids and show them vocational jobs. Philanthropy tends to ignore older Americans when it comes to workforce development. Can you tell us if there, this is a concern for you, especially in light of this conversation or priority, or any solutions or in initiatives you might be developing or considering as a result of this conversation or even before this conversation? Tanya, I'm gonna go to you first. Yeah, let me just first say, uh, I have been educated in the last <laughs> few days and even in the last few minutes of being on this call. You know, traditionally, the foundation has focused on young Black leadership and getting them through the pipeline. Um, what I did not realize, and, and you know, as I told Angela, uh, as you and I were having this conversation, that we cannot afford to leave our, our, our older generation um, behind. In the same efforts that we put into developing global Black leaders, we also need to continue to develop and support um, our older Black leaders as well. And so I do think there's an opportunity here to, 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 to look at programs, to see how the foundation through our lens of developing Black leaders, what does that look like? Does it look like making sure that there is not age discrimination in corporate America or in any other level of, of building this employment pipeline. Um, and so I think the piece that we <laughs> may have left out is how age discrimination can affect building black wealth within a family. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for that lesson. <laughs> it's, we learn we learn from each other all the we time. Learn from I each other. That. Asahi, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with Tanya Moore, and I'd say a couple of things. There would be no young black leaders without our older black leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so that continuity of understanding that young people don't develop on their own. Right. And I think we have overlooked our older uh, black population, but we can we do that at our peril and we do it at our peril, I think, for a number of reasons. If you look at the stats around entrepreneurship in our black womenomics report, we saw that entrepreneurship was one of the key ways to narrow that 90 percent racial wealth gap. Now, who are entrepreneurs? Right. Upwards of 60 percent of entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs are black women. And a large percentage of them are women that are over 50. And in particular, as I talk with them, and this is my day job, I talk to entrepreneurs is what I do. We just had a, a meeting at LaGuardia Community College yesterday with about 40 of them. And what they're telling me is, you know, I came to entrepreneurship. In part, it was a passion for some of them. 
in part, it was out of necessity, but also because I felt locked out from other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I was going to wait for those doors to open. I couldn't afford to wait for those doors to open. I was going to open some doors for myself by launching my card business, by launching my daycare business, right? And so we're seeing that these older Black Americans and women in particular are creating opportunities for themselves. Now, that should be commended. But we, they could do even more if we shone a light on them and invest in them. And as we think about a million Black women, it can't be a million Black young women, right? It's got to be a million Black women more generally. And I'll tell you a story where Condoleezza Rice challenged us about a month ago. When we announced the million Black women, we said, what does Goldman Sachs know about Black women in particular? Our Black Womenomics report, yes, we've done a lot with black, the Black population over the years. But what we need to do is be humble and listen. So at this, uh, as we launched the program, we said, we're gonna have open listening sessions. We've had 41 since March, wow. over 13,000 people across the country have signed into listening sessions. And we were doing one with Dr. Condoleezza Rice, who's on our advisory group board, Steph Curry, Dr. M M Montgomery Rice. I mean, it just you know goes on. And, one of the questions was about the fact that if a Black child has a Black teacher, they're more likely to stay in school, do well in school, all of the data around that. Mm -hmm. And someone raised their hand through the chat and they said, it's great that you're getting more young Black teachers into the system, but what about older teachers, older individuals who could be mentors, even if they're not certified as teachers, where they can be paid to help students, if, they, if it's not the teacher they're seeing in school, how are other ways to integrate that? And we've got a slew of older Black Americans who would want to be a part of that and have wisdoms to impart, but we need to create the structures for them. And that led to a whole different kind of conversation that I'm not sure would have happened otherwise. Now, as we look to, through the listening sessions and the chats, they were just blowing up with people saying, focus more on older Black Americans, older Black women as part of this initiative, and we're doing exactly that. Right. And they're, they're taking care of their families and their grandchildren, and there's a lot that they have on their plate. And, you know, just going back to the entrepreneurship point, um, you know, and, and maybe I've done a lot of reading, uh, maybe you noted this also in an interview, and I've always said this, is that we mentor women really well, but do we invest in them? And do we invest in, we can mentor Black women and say, here, you can be an entrepreneur, but then they need the capital to actually realize that. I would also say that you need to go a step further. And the step further is, are we educating the entrepreneurs that we've been mentoring and, and, and investing capital in to actually educate them as to this workforce that is available to them. And an older workforce, you know, there's a lot of myths, but they're more dedicated. They'll stay around longer. You know, there, there's, there are older workers can be very valuable in businesses. And do we need to educate those entrepreneurs that we're putting in startups and all those things to let them know that there's a workforce out there for you. And it might not be the 22 year old you're thinking of, and you need to open up your hearts and minds for that. So your thoughts there? I think we have to keep reinforcing that because, you know, very often people think about, you know, I want to hire someone It's somebody in a hoodie that they're going to hire and, 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 and that's going to be how they think about it in terms of entrepreneurship. So I think we're not going to make progress in this area as it relates to older workers unless we're intentional every single step of the way and reinforcing it and always asking the question and always raising the point because people tend to look away and focus on, on younger individuals. And I think when you look at the data, exactly as you pointed out, Angela, in terms of their likelihood to you know, stay in the workforce, be loyal, work harder, the data is all there. There's no doubt about it. It's just that they're not getting the attention that they need and deserve to do it. So I think you're right. It's that one-two punch of not only educating the entrepreneur who, as you say, can be sort of over mentored and undercapitalized, but also uh, educating them as to the workforce that is out there that is untapped in their own backyard if they would look at older Americans. Absolutely. Tanya, any thoughts? Yeah, I would add, just going back to the entrepreneur question, I, and I say this all the time, I think it's great that we mentor, we invest, but we forget to sponsor. And so I think it's really important that that last piece is definitely a part of that pie. 
um, me being an entrepreneur myself, I had plenty of mentors. I, to a certain degree, had some access to capital when I needed it. But the real game changer for me was to have sponsors who would walk in the room and sponsor me when I wasn't there. And I believe that if we can build and grow our businesses and our entrepreneurs, I think that could also help solve the problem um, of, of, of closing that gap as it relates to older Black women getting an opportunity. Because we know that we hire our folks <laughs> for the most part. It may take a little bit more education, I agree, but I also think it's also important as we look at how do we successfully um, uh, build more Black businesses that then will support the workforce, there has to be a conversation around how do we make sure that they have sponsors? Because there's right. a difference between you mentoring me and you sponsoring me. Right. And you know, it's interesting. I was just seeing something on chat here and I can turn this kind of into a question, but somebody had noted that, you know, maybe training needs to be more effective because oftentimes, and I'm just reading this, they're seeing that, you know, somebody sits them in front of training and to watch a video and boom, you're trained. But maybe if we take that concept of a sponsor or mentor and really give them that kind of hands-on internship, that might need to be something. And, and you know, um, there was that Robert De Niro movie where he was an intern at eight, you know, 70 years old or whatever. I mean, it, it's never too late. And you always can, can ask that question to say, you know, I might be over 50, but there might be opportunities there. So I think that that's reasonable as well. Um, and a good point that they bring up is that sometimes you need more, more interactive training than just sometimes the video that gets a place before you. Um, Asahi, I just want to ask you a question because we had somebody from Mississippi wondering about the Million Black Women Initiative and, you know, is there anything going on in Mississippi? And I know that this, I want to catch up with it, just got launched and, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so you guys really brought in all of these stakeholders to take, to give you feedback as to where you needed to be. But you do, I was impressed that you did have programs across America and throughout in the Midwest and, and different places in the South. So can you speak to some of those programs that you're, you're doing with yeah, sure. So we've made grants across the country. Um, and so the Million Black Women is, is two parts. It's an investment, the $10 billion of investment. And so we've invested, in, we're investing in technology. We just did a big project uh, in Newark. Um, in terms of the specific project in, uh, in Mississippi, put your name in the chat and I'm going to email you about projects in Mississippi because we have done um, projects in, in, in Mississippi. And I want to be able to be specific around the details for you with respect to, uh, to those. And if you put your information, I'm going to get back to you on that. Yeah, it came in well. through Q&A, but we have, it's Elizabeth Henry, and we will make sure if you want to give it to us, we can pass the information along as well. By the end of the day, you're going to have it, Elizabeth. Um, but part of what the initiative wanted to do was to make sure that we were, one, taking a, a geographically dispersed view. Two, we were worried that if we're going to be too urban centric um, versus, you know, you know, looking at our sisters in rural communities as well. So that's one of the lenses through which we're thinking about our investment. Specific ones that I would mention to you uh, there's one called um, Prosperity Project. Um, this helps individuals who have huge student loans get down uh, their student loan amounts and find ways in which they can get out of that debt burden that, um, that's on their shoulders. And that's regardless of age. You know, it could have been debt that you had for a long time that's problematic. So that's one in particular. Another one is related to getting more Black midwives. Uh, black babies are dying at a much faster rate in this country than white babies. And so getting developing a community of Black nurses and midwives, that's another project in which we've invested. Buy from a Black woman, and these are across the country, so I'm, I'm listing projects that are across the country. Buy from a Black woman, Nikki Portia, we've made a grant to her. Um, that's a hub of Black entrepreneurs all across the country, Mississippi, other places included, um, that are able to be part of that network. And then we funnel business uh, to those um, to those people that are part of that uh, part of that network. Nikki and I just that did an event at H and M over the summer, really you know collaborating with large brands around getting Black entrepreneurs uh, capital. So that gives you a sense of the kinds of projects, but they tend to be very geographically um, specific in certain cases with a real estate investment, but also dispersed in terms of the grant dollars. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And for others who have questions about their particular, I'm getting stuff from Texas and Maryland, we'll capture those questions and make sure we get them to you, Asahi, and then we'll get answers back to them. So thank you, audience, for asking those questions. Um, when we talk about, I just want to go back to metrics a little bit, um, because there's a lot of good stuff that has been talked about. Um, how important is it that we actually follow metrics here and we see, because it's a return on investment for the foundations um, and, and, and for the communities. So how important is it to follow, to look at those metrics and to actually measure what you're doing and also to pivot when you see that things might not be going on track as you expect? So I'll start with you, Tanya. Yeah, I think matrix are, are, are very important because you kind of need to know <laughs> where you're going and how far you've come. Um, and so for us, I think, as it relates to our national racial equity initiative, and we've, we raised about $8 million. We were one of those organizations that many corporations wanted to give to. They wanted to give money to. But one of the things we wanted to make sure that we did is that we didn't just want to take your million dollars. We wanted to create a focus of what we wanted to accomplish in that one year. And you needed to buy into not only with money, but also with aligning with our mission and our purpose as it related to, to the national racial equity. It was very important to me that after a year, we could come back and give a report card. We said we were going to do this. And this is what we accomplished. And this is still the work that we have to do. And so I think in any organization, and particularly if you are saying that you want to remove these barriers and you want to support X, Y, Z, you must come back and you need to kind of know what does that roadmap look like? And did we accomplish it in the time that we said we were? Um, and how long is it going to take us to actually create the change that we all need. Um, I think that goes back to what we're seeing now a year later after George Floyd, where as the young folks say, where are the receipts? <laughs> so you had made all these pledges, right? A million dollars here, this and that. But people wanna know what have you done to move the needle? And I, I think what corporations are having a hard time being able to uh, articulate or why they're having a hard time to articulate the progress that they have made was because there was no matrix or no goals set before the money started rolling in. So, um, those, you know, that's just, that, that's part of what I see the reason why you need to have benchmarks, matrix goals, something needs to be in place. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with Tanya more. And one of the things that's one of the capstones of a million black women is we're going to publish a report for the public to be able to see what did we do? What, what investments did we make? Where did we make it? How many black women were impacted by it? Where along the arc of a black woman's life was it in technology? Was it in healthcare? Was it in housing? Was it in, in, um, in real estate? Like, where did you make these investments and who are you actually helping? Um, that holds us accountable, and it, but it also include, it, it allows the public to hold us accountable. Um, because when you say you're gonna pledge some dollars and help some people, you better do so. And you better be able to show those receipts, as Tanya said, in order to show what exactly you've done and where the impact is. And so that's something before we launched a program that we committed to at the outset. Now we're about five months in and we've made a number of investments, a number of philanthropic commitments. We have an advisory board that's also holding us accountable, you know, likes of, you know, Darren Walker and Valerie Jarrett that are part of that advisory council. So we've got that independent council, the report we're going to publish as well, and frankly, our own people, right? You know, if I'm going to, um, you know, work on this and my colleagues are going to work on this, we want to be able to, with credibility, hands over heart, you know, I'm first and foremost, you know, the daughter of Edith and the granddaughter of Blanche, two black women. Um, and so to be able to say, this is what we're doing in a real way, in an impactful way in communities. So I couldn't agree with you more on the importance of reports and transparency and accountability into which all these dollars are going. 
Absolutely. And Asahi, just talk a little bit more because you've done so much externally, Goldman has. Internally, they're doing a lot as well when they look at, you know, where they need to be from, a, a, you know, an equity perspective or a diversity ex- a perspective. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we've set aspirational goals. Our CEO, David Solomon, um, you know, has been, you know, CEO for the last, you know, three years or so. And um, he was very much focused on diversity and driving diversity at the firm. And as much as, you know, a righteous group of Black women internally were pushing a million Black women, we couldn't get it done without, you know, white men who are behind us and who support this a thousand percent and says not only behind us but with us along the way saying this is what we're, we're going to do and i as ceo i'm going to stand behind it so i commend him and and my colleagues around that kind of uh, that kind of leadership but what he also has done is to say we're going to set aspirational goals of our hiring as it relates to women hispanic individuals black individuals and we're going to publish what those goals are and we're going to set a time frame for when we want to achieve those goals. And again, when a corporation does that, all eyes are on them, but we invited that. The other thing that we did, which we've never done before, was we publish, we usually publish a sustainability report. This year in April, we published a sustainability report and a people report. And that told you for the first time how many managing directors there are at Goldman Sachs. Um, and, you know, we got some press around that. You know, it's like, oh, Goldman Sachs in the Americas only has 49 managing directors. A lot of companies aren't telling you how many people are in the senior ranks, right? But we said, you know what? Are we where we want to be? No. But are we going to hide and not say where we are right now until we get there? No. We're going to say this is where we are right now. And these are the aspirational goals. And so it's not the what we're doing only, but the how we're going about it, I think with a level of transparency, frankly, that, you know, is kind of edgy, it's kind of out there, it's a little scary, it's, it's, it's further than I think a lot of other people are going. Um, but we know in order to make progress, we are willing to do that and take the heat that comes with, you need to have more. And we'll, we say, we should have more. Um, and we want to have more and we're going to be working on having more. So it's that level of engagement and transparency that, frankly, I've never seen before um, across the industry. And we're doing that now. And I'm excited about that prospect. And I think what's important there is that you're willing to be self-aware and pivot when you see we need to pivot and do something else. So it's it's not that fear factor of, um, you know, you're you're willing to meet yourselves in the mirror. And yeah, see what it is, you know, what it is that you need to do. So I, I think that that is very commendable. Um, and I'm going to do a last question for Tanya here. And I'm just, it's very interesting. I have conversations going on both sides. We've got questions, we've got chats, and I'm trying to keep it all together here. Um, Tanya, you know, one of the things I think is important, and Elizabeth White brought this up, is um, even though we're talking about training, reskilling, upskilling, giving uh, women opportunity, Black women opportunity to uh, make sure that they have economic security. There's things that we can't forget about that have been part of the national conversation that have been very important to the Black community. And she brings up social security. And there is, you know, even though we have older Black women who are trying to learn new skills to go into the workforce of tomorrow, And as we said, by 2025, 25% of our workforce is going to be 50 and older. Um, They're still approaching that retirement age, and they see that Social Security is very important for them. And so um, is is CBCF recognizing that? And are are they looking at those programs like Social Security and affordable housing and things like that from a legislative and a policy perspective to make sure that those those type of programs are there to um, supplement and support as well? Yes, of course. So the answer, the short answer to that is, of course. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, what I what I love about my job personally of leading the foundation and the research work and the policy work and the education um, that we do in support of, and I would say empowering uh, or giving our CBC members data and information to help them form good public policy. That's the type of relationship that we have with the foundation. We provide them with fellows and interns and research and data. 
And then they take that information and form good public policy. And I hate to keep talking, and I don't hate to keep talking. I love to keep talking about our National Racial Equity Initiative because it's so broad in the sense of what are those barriers that are in place that we in partnership with the CBC members should be looking at on a policy front to remove. And if you don't know anything about the Congressional Black Caucus, they're bold <laughs> and they <laughs> are very protective and they understand the issues because they've lived, they, they, they've lived through that cycle. Many of them were single moms and many of them have parents that uh, are, can barely make ends meet because social security and other things do not afford them a quality of life. And so these members along with our fellows are really tackling these issues because they've experienced them. And I really think that's what's so unique about the CBC is that many of them are here and advocating and fighting. <laughs> they're feisty, they're fighting <laughs> to make sure that we are able to remove those barriers. So it's not just social security, it's housing, it's, it's discrimination, it's voting rights, it's many issues that prevent us from living a certain quality of life. Um, as one member told me, we need to have a whole life. Right. And so, so I, I, you know, I get somewhat excited and emotional about it as well, because you do have people who are really fighting a good fight. They're getting into good trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you make a very good point. And um, it's kind of like what Goldman identified as the arc of the Black woman. We need to look at all of these different components. Mm -hmm. And um, just to, to put a little... Um, bugging your ear on this, Tanya, um, and Elizabeth brought up this point as well, Elizabeth White, is that, you know, in the jobs bill that we have right now that the Biden administration put forward, older workers are not specifically mentioned in the outline of the bill. And we need to ensure that older Americans generally and older Black women specifically benefit from jobs training, entrepreneurship development, and under the bill. So, you know, that is something that, you know, again, this type of ageism happens and it's not malicious. It's just, we naturally have this default that we kind of go towards younger workers. So we just want to sensitize our, our guests today to just look at those things when you see them um, that, you know, the older worker is not specifically being called out there and oftentimes ignored. Um, I will just leave it before we close is there anything else that you wanted to add, Asahi or Tanya, to this discussion before we close? Angela, this has been a rich dialogue. And to every single person uh, that's tuned in, uh, to the extent that you want to get involved with a million Black women and what we're doing, go to the Goldman Sachs website. You will not have to search far. You're going to be able to click on a button and be part of what, of what we're driving. So we, I invite you for that. I'm on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect. Uh, and we're serious and genuine about this work. We're going to get this done. Wonderful. Tanya? Yeah, I would ju just add um, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, our job is to educate and inform. And if you are not um, a part of our email distribution list, please go to cbcfinc.org. Um, we also, again, we just came out of a, an amazing annual legislative summit with lots of great information those sessions are on our website. And so you can pick and choose. Um, I think this is definitely an important topic. And I think there's an opportunity for more collaboration, not only between the foundation, but the CBC, but as I say, our, 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 our allies as well to come together on an education policy and advocacy front to definitely dive into these issues. Um, there are many things that we could be working on and this is just as important. Oh, wonderful. Well, I just wanna thank these two powerhouse women, Tanya Vesey and also Asahi Pompey. And just thank you for your time and your attention towards this very important issue and for just gracing us today. We really do appreciate it.
Um, and I've enjoyed this conversation immensely for sure. I also want to remind everybody that to mark their calendars again for October 26th, when Gary Officer, our president and CEO of the center, hosts a conversation with Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh to discuss the Biden administration's efforts to rebuild our economy on the foundation of an equitable, resilient workforce. And we will be in touch via email to the participants on today's webinar with that information. Um, I hope we got to most of your questions and comments, and I just want to thank everybody for attending. Have a good day. Thank you.